Okay, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, the three of you here today. And again, we're going to have a conversation here for a bit, but the idea is for you to really think up some questions so you can talk to these uh, very well experienced uh, people in this field uh, and learn from them as well. So I wanted to start first with Dr. Mariner because he is uh, one of the persons who is very familiar with the rinderpest uh, eradication, which you know I have worked for Larry Brilliant for many years and he is part of the smallpox eradication program and I'm constantly correcting him when he says smallpox is the first disease ever eradicated from the planet and I said that's not true there was an animal health disease first so with that we'd really like to have you share with this group how participatory surveillance or participatory epidemiology really played a role in eradicating a disease I think the group would really like to hear about your perspective on that okay thank you for having me and I have to correct, rinderpest was the second disease eradicated. Smallpox was first in the 1960s. Rinderpest was just, 2011 was when it was officially declared eradicated. So it's much more recent. Um, my involvement started in the final phases, the final decade that the disease was around. I came out to Africa in 1990, and I developed a thermal stable vaccine for rinderpest. That's why I came out. I was very much a lab person. And I thought I'd had the, the magic bullet, you know, this is technology and all that. Um, we got the vaccine in production, then I started working in the field, and I realized that it was much more of a socioeconomic problem than a technical problem. And actually what we had to work on was the way people worked and interacted with livestock owners, the information that we used, um, and community-based animal health workers delivering vaccine in remote areas was actually the final mechanism that eradicated rinderpest from, from much of East Africa, the last foci. Um, and I evolved into, I had a job, it was great, I was going around doing surveillance in different areas with the local communities, and we started using participatory rural appraisal to quickly get a handle on what farmers knew about disease. And this was providing tremendous insight. What we were actually tapping into was, was the farmer's knowledge of the history and epidemiology of disease. And as I read about it at the time, what was participation, participatory rural appraisal? It was about knowledge and learning. And actually, that original literature is very much not in favor of data and data extraction. It sees it as a much different activity. And what we were getting into was understanding how livestock owners perceived the disease, the reasons for why it was in a community, why it was there, and actually intelligence about where it was and where we needed to go to eradicate it, and, and the methods that we should use to access it. Yeah. So it was, it was learning from them, yeah? not collecting data, not taking data to a database, but actually sitting down with them and understanding those dynamics. And when we first started to do this, we'd come back and the guys would say, well, this is anecdotal, this isn't science, right? But we kept being right, <laughs> so it was finally accepted. Our first papers we had trouble publishing, and when it was all over, the story we could publish in Science Magazine, and no one asked any questions. So the whole landscape for, let's say, qualitative information research had changed, and people started to, to realize the value of it. But I want to go back to this you know, idea that it's a knowledge system, and what does participation really mean? It means empowering people to design, okay, to express things in their own words, in their own knowledge system, and we're trying to understand their knowledge system. We're trying to place ourselves inside their system, not pick out keywords or something and put them in the database. And one of the first applications was with Rinderpest. They've, they found an outbreak in wildlife in 1994, and it was lineage two Rinderpest. And this virus had not been seen for 30 years. And the big question was, where has this been hiding for 30 years, okay? I was asked to go up into the Somali areas and, and see what I could find out about circulation of the virus in, in cattle. So we got in there, we moved around in Somalia and back into Kenya, and um, collecting <laughs> knowledge about the presence of rinderpest. And we were getting an interesting picture where 50% of people were saying, yeah, we have rinderpest, it's going on all the time. And the other 50% were saying, no, we don't have rinderpest, it's not here. So in some senses, this was confusing. You know, I could put my own interpretations on it as a scientist of what was happening there. Or you could look at it and say, well, half is yes, half is no. They, they don't know, right? 
we went back to the elders, and this is actually a technique in PRA, it's participatory analysis, and we said, this is what we're hearing, what does it mean to you? And the elders said, well, some of us believe we have Rinderpest, and some don't. The problem is the disease we're seeing doesn't kill. It's Rinderpest-like, or mild Rinderpest, right? And that was exactly it. And in that statement, if you unpack it, their case definition for Rinderpest, that term in their language, included death. And this disease didn't kill. It didn't fit their case definition, their classic case definition. It was somehow different. And the translator for this thing was a water expert. He wasn't a you know, veterinary person. So he was just translating as literally as he could. And the, the words the elder chose to use were exactly mimicked how we would try and describe it or speculate on it in English. So this is the point. They were analyzing the situation for us, and they could correctly characterize it. Somalis are amazing with traditional knowledge, by the way. They're, they're, they're some of the best when it comes to livestock knowledge. But that's the point. It's not extracting bits of information, taking it back, and putting it in your database. It's actually understanding how they see the disease circulating and learning new insights from them, insights. And we use this technique to actually target rinderpest eradication, to understand where we needed to go and how we needed to do it. The objectives were much broader than disease detection, first detection. It was actually using it to plan strategies, their knowledge, okay? Using it to know what kinds of delivery systems would work, okay? Yeah. Using it to understand the past history as well as, you know, the, the likely future events that we needed to address, yeah? Um, so that's, it's, a, it's a very different thing. And to correct a lot of the <laughs> misunderstandings in science, at the time and over and over again, I see, I go to places where they think they don't have a disease, they don't have a problem, and it's rampant. Yeah? It's because the, the system of picking out information, the system doesn't work right, right. It actually filters out the key information. So after all this experience, we, we still do this technique. It's not ancient history. We still do it. It's, it's, it's at the core of Pest de Petite Ruminant Eradication, the next global program. It's not about making a system. It's about going out to the communities and learning. That's, that's what it means to me, and that's what it means to us. I just was in Uganda, in Bundibujo. We're working with bats, Ebola risk and taking the, the bat experts out to the field to learn this technique and then interact with the community and learning from the communities there what they know about bats. And it was tremendous, you know? And a lot of things came out. One of the important things was that bats were actually a, an important source of protein in their diet. They don't have much animal agriculture. They depend on hunting still, the, the local communities. And they consume, some of the communities consume a large amount of fruit bats. And, when they talk about it, they say, oh, it's the perfect food for children. It really, you know, it gives them everything they need. It's like, you know, old commercials for Wonder Bread in the United States. You know, it was the, the perfect thing for you to feed your kid. And that's a protein-poor diet. A, a bat would be, a, you know, the key thing. Uh, but this flies in the face, you know, public health is, we've I mean, got to reduce contact with bats, right? Yeah. But at the same time, it's a cornerstone in the, in the nutritional security of these communities. So you need to balance that and see how to, how to work with it. Um, so I'd encourage you to think beyond databases because when you do that, we've tried it, it strips away 90% of the really valuable information. You're left with a residual stuff, but all the glue that anchored that information together is the really, really valuable stuff. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So um, I, I think I'll move next to Dr. Lorak. Um because your system was not designed for a specific disease, but you certainly engage the animal uh, community or you know the the village volunteers who uh, were able to you know do surveillance. And I know you've expanded that. Your system is a true one health system. But I wonder if you want to just share um, you know some of the ideas of creating your system, PawDD, and um, what you had hoped to gain when you thought about creating this system, and is it achieving what you wanted to achieve? Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you, Dr. Mark. Uh, w without SCO Global Trade Fund uh, and Dr. Mark Smolinski, we will not have a PawDD right now. Uh, what, what, what we would like to achieve uh, uh, according to Paul Didi is exactly what uh, 
Jeff uh, talk, we would like to empower uh, the community to uh, early detection and rapid response. Uh, go back when we, when we start uh, uh, thinking or uh, how to design uh, the system. So we, we believe that uh, without community, the rapid or early detection and rapid response would be never possible. So we, we believe in the, the community. And how to uh, engage them, how to listen to them, how to use the language uh, for the system to uh, early detection and the less rapid response. So we, we, we start from that and uh, we develop uh, uh, the uh, technology from uh, allowing them to participate at every step. It's not only what our idea, what we will, for, for the technology part, we test with them. But for the content part, they are uh, our partner to decide. Not, not, not that uh, we decide for them. And I think that uh, in, in the past, maybe, almost uh, nine years, we, we achieve uh, several things and we can prove that uh, it's, it's really uh, happened, that uh, the system can help the community, these lay people, to detect and stop outbreak. For example, dengue. If it's only in the hand of the authority, it will be not possible to control. But in, in uh, our uh, experience, uh, even the, the mayor who, who has no idea of the uh, public health profession, uh, he, he uh, completes only the secondary grade from informal education. But he can control and he can use also the data collected in the system to find where is the problem and where, how should be controlled. That's Great, it. well we'll come back to some of your examples. Um, before that I want to welcome Dr. May, uh, who you've taken on a, a different approach and really gone after vectors uh, surveillance. And I'm wondering if you can share, you know, sort of uh, um, the rationale for why you, you focus on your incredible system, MoBuzz, which is a great name. Um, so if you could just share sort of, you know, your concepts of why you focused in, on that angle specifically, because uh, we're seeing a very rapidly growing interest in vector surveillance, obviously, as vector-borne diseases are increasing. Thank, thank you, Mark, for um, inviting me to the panel. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested to hear the perspectives of Dr. Marina and um, Dr. Latrac that it is a community-driven project. Um, for MOBAS, we really approach it from the angle of technology. So um, around uh, you know, close to, to 2010, uh, I uh, was a younger scholar working on health communication, uh, looking at how we could use technology to uh, make a difference in the public health space, in particular infectious disease space. And of course, we know about the experiences uh, of the of my region, especially Singapore, or Hong Kong, and so on, where we had uh, gone through SARS and other types of infectious diseases. So I was um, I was uh, part of a team that was. Uh, um, involved in looking at how technology can make a difference. And in particular, we wanted to nudge uh, certain types of behaviors that will make a difference uh, in terms of the larger public health space. So we really started off by looking at the types of threats that were prevalent in the communities in Southeast Asia and, uh, you know, and where there might be certain types of gaps. And uh, Vector came to mind because it was rising in numbers, 
in fact, the, the geography of vector is so interesting because as I was doing work, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia, a very tropical place where there's a lot of uh, dengue and previously malaria issues, the, uh, the threat of vector was, was rising. And um, I had colleagues in places like Korea and Japan, which had never experienced uh, dengue that were reporting that, you know, dengue was coming to their shores. And of course, later on, I learned that the mosquitoes also travel in planes and so on. So we, uh, we were very um, lucky to be able to travel to some of the regional countries and to see what was happening on the technological front. So we identified that um, there were a number of countries where the mobile technology was also booming. So this was just about 10 years ago. You know, suddenly uh, from uh, landlines, there was a lot of people who were utilizing mobile phones and social media as well. So that whole technological change was happening across our region. And uh, we realized that uh, dengue uh, is one particular disease where uh, a lot of uh, impact can be had through human behavior, removing stagnant water, you know, wearing long sleeves and, and so on. And so we wanted to make a difference in that particular space. And, um, and, and really, you know, um, go, going through the development of the, the app, the system and so on, we realized that it really needs to be a partnership of so many parties, um, the community, the government, the health authorities, and the private sector too. And for us in Sri Lanka, all these different parties came together. We actually tried to you know, go to a couple of countries to see where these um, uh, different partnerships would work. And, and Sri Lanka was kind of where everything came together. And we were able to uh, launch the first uh, version of MOBAS and I think that when we were doing that and, you know, somehow um, you heard that I was doing work there, I was invited to the uh, EPIHEC in Cambodia. So that just about a decade ago, I met this um, wonderful community of, you know, ending pandemic scholars and so on who have helped to shape the um, my whole journey in MOBAS as well. So in um, uh, 2018, we managed to have an EPIHEC in Colombo where we've got an enhanced, so now it's MOBAS Plus uh, version that was developed and, um, and that's been my journey since. Oh, great, thank you. Um, for those of you now that we've mentioned EPIHEC a couple of times, just a quick um, explanation of what that is. So. Uh, that's an approach that we've developed at any pandemics that um, we work directly with governments to improve disease surveillance. And the way we do that is by bringing technologists from that country to work directly with their government officials to create innovative solutions to disease surveillance. And so it's done over the course of a week. Um, we're on the first day of the uh, EpiHack the health experts uh, in both the human and animal sector, and often if we can find the environmental sector to come in, um, they then address all of these developers from their countries, or even developers that we bring in from previous EpiHacks in neighboring countries, um, to really share with these developers their dreams about what they wish they could do in surveillance. And then the developers, side by side with the health experts, spend the week hacking away and developing prototypes and ideas for disease surveillance and then we fund uh, the the best ideas that come out uh, at the end of those weeks and so we've had epihex in many different countries but that's the process that we have found has been incredibly successful because it's much easier for a government to get behind and promote and to use a system that they actually developed themselves with their own technologists rather than somebody bringing a solution to that country. So that's just a brief uh, explanation of the EpiHack. So coming back to you, Jeff, um, so it, y the important messages that you talked about in really gaining uh, you know, the understanding of the community and so forth, have you given any thought or um, what are your thoughts about you know, engaging communities to think about one health as opposed to you know, just a, a, an animal disease? Has that arisen after communities have been so successfully engaged for a particular disease? Has there been a 
um, you know, a clamoring for, hey, can we do more with this? Or where do you think you could take, you know, that successful approach uh, for RenderPest and really, you know, what can we do to have communities really engage much broader? Y yeah. Um, well, this has been, since RenderPest, a continuous evolution. And certainly, we've used it a lot in One Health. After Rinderpest, we went to <laughs> Bird Flu, uh, which was a real learning experience for me as we started to work with public health experts. And the interesting thing, of course, is each profession has its own culture. And I was continually blindsided by some assumptions that public health had about surveillance and different things. And one was they really like structure, right? And their goal in surveillance is they want to be able to make estimates and look at trends and things like that, which is one of the values of surveillance. We can't do it so much in animal health because we don't have the intensity of data. Um, so there was a communication barrier there that this was a qualitative approach, that it was more about learning and helping people to, to get that idea on board. Um, but they did it, and, and I think there's uh, many instances where we were successful, but it was just interesting that the challenge is there. So we've used it for One Health applications. At the community level, you know, they, they understand the interactions of people and animal and the diseases. Um, they're very aware of many of the zoonoses. You know, the, the, the awareness is not complete, but um, there's a lot of knowledge there of that. And like the example I just gave, that's, that's Ebola, bats, people's interaction with bats, um, and interesting things that go on. One of the surprising things was we went to the communities, and every community we talked to us said, the health department came and told us Ebola is caused by bats, which we don't know. <laughs> so actually the health department was putting out misinformation to scare them to stop having contact with bats, because we actually haven't documented transmission of Ebola from bats to man. It's not known. Ebola's only been found once in a bat, okay? Marburg's a bit different, yeah. But at that level, they were then asking us, well, is this true? Can we get Ebola from our bats, you know, from, from these interactions? And the answer is, we don't know. I also find, I work with community-based animal health workers, and now I have a project which is about combining community-based animal health and, and community health. What are the synergies there? Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last few months, is, is interviewing on that. Go to communities, and we find that the community-based animal health worker, raise your hand, right? Now, who's a, who's a health worker? Same person raises <laughs> their hand. The systems don't even know that they've trained the same person. But they go out and they give you know, guidance on who you should select, someone who's trusted, respected, hardworking, um, you know, clever. They pick the same guy <laughs> for, both, for both systems. Yeah. So in a certain sense, on the ground, they're ahead of us on One Health, yeah? and in some senses. And it's important to realize that, that nobody has the, the monopoly <laughs> on insight on these things. Yeah, thank you. Great. So Dr. Lertok. Um, you, you're probably too humble to share with this group that uh, your system, the PAWDD system, um, won the Trinity Challenge out of 340 systems in 66 countries. The PAWDD system from Thailand was the grand prize winner uh, of the most innovative uh, use of surveillance, and congratulations to your team on that. Um, can you talk about your system has been operating for quite a few years now? Um, you know, for this group to really understand, you know, what does it take to keep that system so robust and active and the community engaged? And also, you've taken that from what was started in, you know, one uh, area uh, in northern Thailand, and you have certainly expanded that system over time. So maybe for those in the audience who have not yet uh, worked within a participatory surveillance and are just thinking about that, um, maybe help share some of, you know, the uh, the insight that you have of, of what it's taken to keep PAWDD uh, such a robust and active system? Um, uh, to answer this uh, question, I think mostly things about uh, the incentive for uh, the villagers or for the commodities. In, in our case, it's a local government to use the system and w when we start the system we uh, nobody can touch it uh, it's just an idea 
and then we develop uh, the app and we persuade them to report, uh, to establish the reporters uh, so, so that the signal can be captured. So we, we start with uh, providing them uh, some money as the pub, as the generally the public health volunteer got from the government to report for 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 the reporter mm. but for for the local communities they they get nothing but i think most important important importantly for uh, the incentive is to support them to succeed in disease control it is not only reporting to the system but uh, Paul did also support them to contain the outbreak, both uh, in animal uh, disease outbreak and human disease outbreak. This is very much uh, incentive and meaningful incentive for the local community themselves and for the reporter. The reporter will feel uh, they are are very proud to help uh, their community, to help safeguard their community from the outbreak. Mm -hmm. that, that I think this is the, the very uh, key issue to keep the system active. And can you talk a little bit about how it had expanded from a pilot project in uh, one district or province, I, I can't remember if it was in a district or a province, but you have certainly expanded over time. Has that um, uh, been more of an organic process? Uh, I remember some conversations early where, you know, one of the neighboring districts who saw PAWDD operating where, you know, we had provided the phones for the volunteers um, said, well, we have our own phones. We can do this, you know, just show us how it's done. So. Have you seen it, uh, you know, obviously it took some resources to create the system and get it started, but how has that expansion uh, gone on with, um, you know, with less resources obviously than you had at the beginning? Has it been because communities are putting in some of their own resources and owning the system? Or how have you been able to go from your initial pilot to now several different parts of Thailand who are using your system? Yeah, we we uh, we are actually uh, still trying to achieve that. We 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 have right now uh, about uh, 100 uh, sub districts who are quite active uh, using the system in order to uh, contain it, the outbreak. I think uh, the key answer is is how to make the system relevant to them. So uh, the, how, uh, to answer this, this is, uh, firstly, it's, it's, uh, let them participate in the planning, in the design, what, what they need. And so if, if we, we, we think about uh, uh, this expanding, when, when we are selling our ideas, every community, every people, every, also uh, the academic, uh, the authority, they are quite fascinating and they would like to, uh, to use the system. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's not easy. Mm. In, in, in reality, in the real world, it's, it's, there are many challenges. For example, it's, uh, the silo thinking of the authority themselves it, it can uh, prohibit this. And uh, we pro provide them uh, the technology, the digital tool, but it is not easy to find, to realize the appropriate one. We, we, in our experience, we also lost some years because we are not quick enough, we were not quick enough to adapt our uh, app or when, when we are in the uh, developing period with no problem. 
we, we have a full <laughs> resource to use, but when we are going by our own, when we, the community point out to, to us that, oh, you should, uh, one volunteer, they change the mobile phone, and they, they cannot uh, go back to use the app anymore, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. So this, and when we expand this, we, we test uh, the model how to uh, effectively expand. And we, uh, we use three models. It's, uh, the first one, uh, let, let uh, the model led by the university at Chiang Mai University has been uh, successful. But that is fail. That was fail. Uh, the second model is we use uh, the authority at the provincial level. That's, that is quite, quite good. But the best, the best one is the community themselves. Uh, they expand by their community leader and ask the other and show the other community leaders how to use the system. Mm. That is very helpful. Mm. Very good. Okay, I hope you're getting your questions ready because we're coming to the crowd next. But before we do that, I want to ask Dr. May, um, you know, because, oops, one of the, um, as we go through and look at the different uh, sectors in the workshop, um, one of them will be about vector-borne disease. And I'm just wondering if you can share with the group how you've seen vector surveillance kind of change over the years and maybe even some of the innovations that you see coming down the pike that really might change the way we think about vector surveillance. Okay. Um, you know, where uh, vector or mosquitoes are concerned, uh, you know, in the very early days of um, the participatory surveillance work, it was, uh, and I think, um, Dr. Marina, you also talked about, you know, uh, publications, how difficult it was. If you look at that, you know, public health space, you would see journals like uh, neglected tropical diseases, and it was uh, kind of categorized in those areas that it was something that was uh, only in certain countries and it is small scale. But over the years, with the threat of dengue, especially moving into urban areas, we have seen that this has become very mainstream. And in fact, the approach, you know, in many countries um, has also been that somehow mosquitoes are not considered under the Ministry of Health, and they would be considered under the Ministry of Environment. I'm not sure if any uh, of the countries face this. So the work that I do often aligns with Ministry of Health, and they'll say, no, no, this is under Ministry of Environment. And um, if I can just share with you this, this um, you know, little story, it's not so much mosquitoes, but it's actually a snake story. In uh, Singapore, uh, we have snakes sometimes in the uh, homes and so on. So one of the um, neighbors in my neighborhood found a snake in a drain outside the, uh, her house. And, uh, you know, she called the authorities and the housing um, people, the housing uh, board said, no, 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 this is not my priority because it is in the drain. And then the, 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 uh, the people who are in environment said that, no, this is not my, ours e either because it is, you know, in the water. And then the, um, the, the but public utilities board had to come in, the people who fix the pipes. So it's almost like that had been that sort of case where Vector was concerned. But over the years, especially in Asia, I have seen that it is moved to uh, a mainstream public health issue. And therefore, the considerations that you know, we have, have heard about in terms of how to motivate the public to report and so on have become related to humans rather than just killing the, the mosquitoes. You know, the human behavior has become very important. And in that regard, I think that even the Ministry of Environment, who is, who is in charge of the, this, this problem, has realized that it's so important to engage with the public, both at the intrinsic level and the extrinsic level. So on the extrinsic level, there is the different types of rewards and, and so on that you know, has been put in place so that you can report um, information. But even looking at the, the intrinsic level, and this is what, um, you know, 
the, the um, researchers uh, and the scientific community are trying to do, how do we uh, ensure that you know the, the some of the behaviors, um, like I mentioned to you, um, removing stagnant water and so on, become part of, of everyday behaviors. And I think that so much more needs to be done by the scientific community to, to understand you know, the, the psyche and the cultural facets um, behind these behaviors and then incorporate them into our systems so that they become uh, part of the, the, the behavior changing landscape. Mm, very good. Okay, so now's your chance. You have incredible brain trust up here on the stage. I know you must have questions that have come up uh, and we're happy to to take the questions from the audience and please. Yep, yeah, so they can see you. Hey, uh, Michael Wilkes from the University of California. I I've got a question that sort of transcends uh, all of this. S surveillance, as we know, can have both positive and negative connotations uh, to the public, particularly in authoritarian uh, countries. So if we surveil for things like standing water, the use of, of uh, bed nets, so the use of agrochemicals, how do we balance the benefits, the public health benefits of surveillance against the fear on the part of the public of an over-intrusive government that may want to use this uh, data for nefarious reasons? I kind of share the concern, and it's not just the use of data for nefarious purposes. You know, I'm, I'm an American, maybe that's a unique perspective, but why do people need to know these things? You know, and you really need to balance that. It's intrusive. It's our privacy. It's not just nefarious purposes, it's our privacy. And to what extent, you know, do we need to collect this data? Is it really justified? Um, I think that's a delicate question. In the eyes of the person who wants the data, it's, it's extremely valuable, but maybe they're not the best judge of, of that from a broader perspective. And you need involvement, if you want to say a participatory approach, bring in the community and talk about what data do you really need, and do you need that data from me? Yeah, yeah um, so I wanted to ask a clarification on your question because there, you know, there's surveillance and we're talking about participatory surveillance. So is the missing factor for you, uh, Michael, is that uh, you know, what we're finding from communities is participatory surveillance is you know, the bi-directional transmission and receiving for action. So for example, when we've gone out, um, you know, both here in Cambodia and in Thailand, and we've visited you know, communities who are using these applications, the first thing that we're told is, well, someone comes and helps us. So when, you know, Paw DD reports that somebody calls in and says there were three dead chickens, somebody showed up to test my chickens and tell me did they have bird flu or did they have Newcastle disease? So I just wanted to get clarification from your system or your question. Are you asking about that from participatory surveillance or just surveillance in general? I guess, um given the focus of the conference uh, from a participatory perspective. But um, Mark, I think there's a thin line, right, between participatory surveillance for three dead chickens that might be from Newcastle, but it also may be from toxic agrochemicals that have been used in the field. And now the participants are actually telling on their neighbor that I think they're using this or I think they're using that. And the question is, you know, when do we stop getting truth? Because people are so afraid that the government's going to come in and, and clamp down on illegal agrochemicals or, you know, punish people that aren't using bed nets because they've told them that they're supposed to use bed nets, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's a fair question. Please. I, I, um, Michael, I think that there, there, there are, I guess, two things that maybe I can think about. And um, one is that um, at least, you know, in, in all the work that we have done, we have uh, ensured that we adhere to the um, highest ethical standards and data management plans. So the the you know consent uh, giving and how the data is utilized, how it is shared, anonymized, uh, if it is going to be um, to be further analyzed, 
um, by third parties and so on. That's uh, that's typically put in place. Um, but I think like where what you're talking about, you know, the concern about how um, the the data may be used. Um, I think that it comes down to the consideration of uh, communication and how um, the uh, the benefits, right, versus the uh, potential risk are communicated. And your um, your example brings to mind, uh, you know, some of the issues that we had when we were asking the um, the the communities to report on water ponding because some of the water ponding was happening in the neighbor's houses or in front of the neighbor's house, and they were worried that somebody would come and say that, oh, your neighbor reported this. Okay. You know, so we had to be really careful and uh, communicate the benefits of the system in such a way that, you know, help your neighbor and help yourself and can maybe help to explain to the neighbor too. And that differs from community to community because even within Colombo, for instance, where the project was going on, we had the um, Chinese construction workers and they were particularly concerned about other types of interracial issues uh, within the Sri Lankan community as well. So, um, so kind of you know looking at, at at how the communication of the benefits is done, and and that um, the, these issues are communicated at the ground level was important to us. Very good. Please weigh. Oh, hi, Sylvia. Hi, can I, Sylvia. Can I? Please wait. We have one one more response. Sorry, Sylvia. Uh, I, I would like to respond to this question. I think it's quite uh, uh, quite interesting. I think uh, your question is, is uh, the answer that why we need the One Health approach, why, why we need uh, uh, the One Health surveillance system, because the conventional surveillance system cannot answer such uh, uh, what, what you asked. So, the conventional system ignore the part participatory of the uh, community, ignore the knowledge of the community. So, and if you use that uh, conventional system to, uh, to for this case, they will hide. They will not give you the real uh, data when when you go out and collect. But if we use from the Beginning on the, uh, this uh, uh, ongoing surveillance system using the one tail approach, we will uh, overcome such a, a, a dilemma. That's the, you, you didn't get the real data from uh, the situation. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, one of the things about the original PRA methods was about bias right, and the reasons why people say what they do, whether they want to share with you or not, and how to get through that. And, you know, most conventional research tries to neutralize bias with a random sample or something. The PRA method, you try and understand bias. You try and understand all these reasons why people might wa want to collaborate with you, because you're ultimately trying to do an intervention, and you need to understand all these different viewpoints and how it's going to impact your program. For Rinderpest, people were afraid of quarantine, right? And in other situations, birds do the same. Oftentimes with animal health, it's, it's about quarantine or destruction of the animals. But if you sit with them and, and build trust, you, know, you can usually get through that and understand what the real situation is, but it takes time. You need to spend that hour with them or maybe a day in the community talking to different people. And ultimately, too, it's the participatory design, as Dr. Lertrek is, you know, if you're collecting data that nobody wants you to collect, well, you're not going to be successful. But actually designing and talking with the community about that data, yeah, um, and what you're going to do with it, yeah, and then sticking to that agreement will help you a lot, too. And that's, that's an ethical approach to surveillance as well, you know. Um, people don't want to know where their data is going, what it's going to be used for, and they have a right, they have a right to that. Yeah, it shouldn't go off to anybody. It should be for the purposes that they shared it with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Sorry, Sylvia. Um, I'm following the previous question. Um, how, from your experience, uh, how it was when the community themselves didn't want to report because of they could be affected economically or had some pressure from the outside, et cetera. 
So when the community decided not to report, for example, we had some such cases in our country, and because of, let's say, brucellosis, they didn't want to report because they wanted to keep the animal. So how did you face this in pure, uh, poor communities? I'll, I'll start. For us, we didn't penalize the individual for sharing the information. We, we learned about the situation that informed responses. It didn't necessarily mean that that individual was going to get his animal destroyed, right? So it was about building trust and, and looking what were appropriate solutions given the situation. And oftentimes in the, in the scenario you're describing, destroying that individual's animal isn't going to solve the problem. It's just going to exacerbate the problem for why people don't report. So you want to understand why aren't people reporting? Why aren't people cooperating with us? Well, because you're doing things that they perceive are bad for their livelihoods. So you need to change your strategy. You need to be partners with them. And that's really the message of the participatory approach is how do I partner with this community to solve the problem with them, not to inflict the solution on them that maybe works for other segments of society, but how do we come to a win-win scenario? And that's, that's the nature of you know, the participatory approach. The other thing is systems, you know, I'm not a big supporter of systems because you're trying to anticipate problems in the future. One of the assumptions of participation is that you can't anticipate everything that's important. You need a flexible method that's built for discovery, yeah? Because things are going to happen. There's knowledge out there that you can't anticipate as an expert sitting in your office. So you go out open-ended, okay? Open-minded and prepared to <laughs> absorb anything that comes up and try and understand it. It's, and it's a challenge sometimes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, for, for uh, Paul DD, our system in Thailand, we uh, first of all, we solve this problem by calling the system that this is not the community-based system, but it's a community-owned system. This is your own for your benefit. It's not for your penalty. <laughs> it's not uh, reporting uh, to the ministry and they will call your animals, but it's will, the, the, the system is developed for your first, you will benefit it first. And you, will, you own this system, you own this data. And we help them uh, achieve this goal. So, <laughs> that's it main be. Thank you, Dr. Latrak. I agree with Dr. Latrak on the uh, ownership for sure, but you know, in the mosquito space, the reverse actually happened, meaning that uh, the the sometimes the community or the uh, public don't uh, want to report because they think nothing happens because all this data is collected, and then I've been reporting every day for the past five weeks, and I still have the mosquitoes. So it was kind of the reverse problem that we had. And um, in, in that regard, what we needed to do and, you know, working together with the, yeah, the, the municipal uh, council was that we had to ensure that if there were hot spots that were surfacing across the city, that some visible action was undertaken. So, so we learned and um, the, the team that led by Dr. Weija Muni in, um, in Colombo were very creative and proactive. So what they did was they, um, they got uh, what I could only call as a SWAT van. So it was like painted, you, you know, with the, the mosquito, anti-mosquito uh, 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 team. And every morning at 5 a.m., they would set out to the hot spots. And then they would spray and they would, you know, fumigate and do whatever is necessary for just about one or two hours. And they did this for a couple of weeks. So it was very visible response. And so people could see that if we were responding, then the, um, you know, there was some action that was taken as well. Yeah, please. Uh, and I also would like to remind you that you should not forget that it's not the only the people sometimes does not like to uh, report. But on some or many occasions, maybe more than the community themselves, the authority, they avoid to report the real uh, occurrence. 
Okay, Kuchin. So, I mean, um, Jeffrey mentioned a bit that there is databases and structures in public health, but also in veterinary. We now are developing quite a lot of data collection tools. And there is community knowledge. So there is this, not black and white, but it's this gray area where we transcend from the knowledge of community to data. And then we, we analyze data and we get knowledge back again. So in your practice of work, but not only, but also for, for Dr. May and, and, and Dr. Dutrak, I mean, you, you use systems and structures to collect the public knowledge and then use it into a data and then transliterate it again back to the data. So this gray area, how, how we can practically, or in your experience, how practically it's used, because that's, that's the key thing, I think. It's not just data for the sake of data, but getting actions. <laughs> a surveillance system consists of multiple methods, right? Yeah, many different systems. So I think it's fine that there's a structured system collecting structured data uh, for analysis and you can look at trends, right? But that's gonna miss things. It's, it's not gonna capture the full value. So you need qualitative activities alongside that and those will complement each other, yeah? And they'll fill in the gaps in each other for them. Um, so my learning with the public health situation was they needed to take on board that they needed a flexible system to deal with the unanticipated. They needed a flexible system that would deal with the gaps in the, in the structured system. And that was the point. When we went to Indonesia for bird flu, we set up this huge program. I think we trained 3,000 people in the end. And, it, with our, and it was a mistake. That didn't add value. What I realized was we would have been much better off having trained 20 people really well who went out and did assessments and came up with scenarios that really captured the local knowledge about bird flu. And that would have been as informative and much more sustainable which, than this army of reporters who were just, you know, there was a lot of bird flu out there was what we got out of that. And keywords in a database, which really didn't help us to understand what to do, right? And those issues like culling animals were the things that were getting in the way. Yeah, that was the solution, but it was actually causing us to be an enemy <laughs> of the public. <laughs> yeah, and they wouldn't want to cooperate with the government because it would result in destruction of your chickens. Yeah? Which, you know, why would anybody want that? They, they weren't dying of bird flu, right? There wasn't that immediate need in their life. Okay. Uh, our, our system was. Uh, Decide for for one health also a benefit. That means uh, they work together and uh, and all party can can use the data. So, uh, but anyway, we focus uh, when we decide uh, for DD. We focus first the benefits of the community. But it does not mean that the the data will not. Uh, go to the government. The government will, uh, will uh, help them contain the outbreak and also investigate which is the really cause. Uh, the more detailed uh, information the government should do by themselves. But this, our system will provide a signal of the, uh, uh, of the outbreak to the government and not waiting until uh, the government decide what to do. The, the community can also uh, deploy the, the uh, uh, response measure to the suspected outbreak, to contain the outbreak timely as well. So the, 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 the data will be for all. We, we see the outcome at three levels, the government or the health authorities, and then the uh, community leadership, and then the individuals. And I shared with you about the government and the health authorities, what they had tried to do uh, as part of their uh, vector control strategies. But in the space of the community and the individual, it was really important for us also to have 
uh, the, the health education that would uh, enable the understanding of the individual actions. Um, as an example, one of the groups that we targeted were the, the, um, the primary or the grade schools where there was a lot of incidents of um, uh, dengue as well. So in this particular space, the um, information would be shared with the schools that were particularly at risk. But it wasn't just telling the schools to remove garbage or make sure that there's, you know, you, you make sure there's no mosquitoes around in the, in the school surroundings, but also the schools to provide educational material that's targeted at children that the, the kids could understand. And so, you know, so, so the children then become uh, ambassadors to vector control, so to say. And then they, when we hope that they go back and help to inform their parents as well. So we've been doing a lot of outreach through uh, the schools as well. Great. Okay. I, I don't know who is next. I see Danny. Yeah, just a question uh, regarding the compensation, financial compensation system. How does it have a role and how does it affect positively and negatively the participatory surveillance? I think this to you, the, uh, the question is um, the compensation uh, for the person's reporting. How has that influenced your system, either positively or negatively? Uh, I, yes, I think the compensation is a need. And uh, for that, that is why we uh, choose the local government as the key actor at the, the local community in, uh, in our system. So that uh, they have a resource, enough resource to compensate. Uh, I can uh, provide you one example. There, there is an, an, an outbreak in a village, and uh, the, the, the symptom is, is like a bird flu in, in chicken. And in that, in that village, there is also a big company that the, they have a brooder uh, the, the, uh, to pr produce the chicken for. And in this case, uh, when, when there's, uh, the villagers uh, capture the signal of the outbreak, the company go out, went out and help with the villagers to contain the disease and they pay. And they pay very little. They, they pay maybe uh, 10,000 baht to save uh, 10 million baht in this case. Yes, in the back. Um, thank you very much to uh, the presenters. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, in the conventional surveillance, uh, there is a kind of trust between health worker and the community, and they are willing to report. For diseases such as uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers, uh, Lassa or Ebola, uh, people don't want people to know, especially within the community, for fear of stigma. So I'm wondering, how does the participatory surveillance addresses issues of confidentiality, especially within the communities? Thank you. Uh, in, in, in our system in, in, in PODD, we this, is, this is, is very important because uh, the, the community leader or the local government, they, they will only know who report. And they have to keep this. So it's also the, the official system. They have to keep this secret. Otherwise, there will be so on. So it's, it's important. Part of your design, keep. yeah. Yes, please. While they're bringing the microphone to you, I just want to quickly share a story that sometimes I think we also forget, you know, we focus on the individual farmer and calling the chickens. I remember here in Cambodia, we went out to visit a farm uh, where through the hotline he had reported the first few uh, dead chickens on his farm, which resulted in all of his chickens being called. And when we went out to visit the farmer and asked him about that, I think what was really important was his sense of his position in the community. So for him to have all his chickens called 
if that saved all of his fellow farmers in that village, he said that was enough. And that it was better for him to have his chickens all killed off than to not have reported it. And all of the farmers in the village would have had their chickens lost. And I thought that was really important that sometimes we forget the sense of community and how that influences an individual's actions. So please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to find out uh, with regards to involving uh lay people, community health workers in participatory, participatory surveillance. Uh, and this is with re regards their training, right? So uh, how is their training package like, uh, like, like, does it have, uh, is it, is, are they trained to, to, to um, are they trained for longer periods of time, for example? Do they have continuous capacity building uh, programs, supportive supervision to help them cope with the, uh, I assume it's much more knowledge which they have to, you know, um, capturing and being able to do uh, this whole um, uh, uh, kind of system of monitoring all uh, events in animals, in humans. So how does it work in terms of capacity building and ensuring that their capacities are constantly at the optimum, considering are you talking about maybe involving lay people in participatory surveillance? Thank you. Mm, great. So the question is about the training and how do you keep the training up to date and, and current and how does, how does your system uh, account for the training components of people using it? The, uh, so this is kind of the, f the what we might call as the frontliners who have to answer questions about the system. So, um, so I was I was pretty lucky that in Colombo itself, the um, public health inspectors or the inspectorate was uh, the frontline uh, staff, and so they were all trained in terms of how to use the system. And I mentioned to you that you know there were also the subpopulations or the uh, other, the communities where there might be specific um, health educational needs. So we also um, avail to them in their iPad different types of uh, health communication tools. So even if they were not equipped to deal with a particular group, for instance, I mentioned about the construction workers from China. So there would be. Uh, you know, like a translated version of some of the health education material so that they could share with that particular group. But, um, but training, you know, went on for, for the public health inspectors and they became um, part of that um, very helpful group that could outreach the communities. And they knew the communities, each of them, you know, like uh, handle one particular uh, geographic region in the city and, and knew the people there and so on. So they really helped to disseminate the information. Um, I spent a lot of time, the, the words participation, community-based, and then community programs, they're all very confused. And whenever someone uses one of these words, you have to ask exactly what they're doing because people are using the words in very different ways. Community-based doesn't necessarily mean the same as participation. You can do a participatory activity that is not community-owned, that doesn't have agents in the community working for you. Yeah? They, they're related. When you're doing something community-based, you probably have strong elements of, of participation. What I see is, is programs that will go out and use community agents. They'll employ them to do something. They'll give them a task, a form to fill in. You know, and That's not community-based. As Dr. Latrec has outlined, it's owned. They're in the design. They're deciding what information is being collected, how it's being used. Yeah? That's community-based. But if you're just recruiting agents from a community, it's a community program, and I, I go around now visiting community health and community-based animal health programs, and they're really very different. And some of them, I'm not saying it's bad, but they're a community program. They're not community-based. Yeah? And on the same thing with participation, what elements of participation are they using? Yeah? Are they really involving people in the analysis? Are they tapping into knowledge systems? Are they taking a learning approach? Yeah? How far are they going with participation? To your question, if you're going to do community-based, you need to have regular refreshers. You need to meet frequently with the people. Treat it more as a, as a networking event. Yeah, you can introduce some training topics. They like to learn. Yeah? But it's keeping that network alive. 
And what I'm seeing now, too, is community animal health workers and community health workers being networked in one system. And that's wonderful, because then they can talk about zoonoses, and they really share common interests. Uh, so moving forward, I see this you know, becoming like a, a one health thing at the community level. Yeah. Very good. So we're down to our final five minutes. We could still take another question, but I do want to give you each a chance to just any final words of wisdom that you want to share with this group. Um, so think about that while we take another question. I don't, way in the back, I guess, is next. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Dr. Mahbubur Rahman uh, from uh, an Institute of Epidemiology Disease Control and Research, Bangladesh. I should acknowledge that we don't have much uh, experience on participatory surveillance, but uh, we had some discussion uh, like uh, how to initiate that. And uh, so uh, for my actually my uh, clarification, like when we are thinking of uh, participatory surveillance and uh, getting report from the uh, community, what would be our feedback to them and how that would be implemented, whether that should be a tire base, like uh, 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 I'm from the human side, so if I expect some uh, uh, reporting of ILI symptom influenza like uh, uh, illness uh, symptom to, to be reported to me, how would I or the, the, the person who is reporting uh, expect uh, to support him or her, otherwise it's, they will not report you. But uh, if uh, it is uh, like uh, controlled by the national uh, team, how they will support a, a person in the periphery, in the local level. So whether there should be uh, some tire based, like uh, the report should go to the local level first and that will be conveyed to the central level. And again, when we are talking about our early warning system, how would we interpret that single report? Like when we'll uh, call it, it can be a a uh, uh, warning for uh, like uh, outbreak, local outbreak, or whether there is some clustering. So we are kind of struggling with that uh, uh, development of that system. And I don't know whether uh, you have uh, any experience uh, or sharing of any experience or you have any advice for that. Great, thank you. So maybe that's a good question to also give a final word of wisdom. I think uh, if I understand what he's asking is, is the element of the bi-directionality. So what maybe in each of your experiences, what are you giving back directly to the community that's helping keep them engaged uh, in their system? If you have some words of wisdom to share on, as people are thinking about the new systems, it's easy to think about the data you want to get from the community, but what we often forget about is the bi-directionality. What are you giving back to the community that makes them feel like it's community owned? Uh, system that they're part of. So we'll, we'll start with Dr. May and, and, in, and include any other final comments that you might want to make as we're in our last five minutes. Yeah, um, you know, when, when I kind of look back at, at my own journey, but also to look at um, the projects that I have been involved in, and not just Vector, but on the human side. So we have Flutech, which was, of course, inspired by a lot of Craig Dalton's work in Australia, and, and your work flew near you um, in the US. The, um, I, I think that it's always good to be able to start with either a community or an organization that's particularly interested in this space. So perhaps working with one hospital or one organization, I know in Craig's case, you work with, with um, uh, businesses you know, which may have factories and, and so on. So there must be a reason why they would be interested in participatory surveillance and what they can, can um, get from having such a system. So in my case, the flu tech was born out of the need of the uh, Singapore's largest uh, uh, hospital for uh, infectious diseases, Tan Tok Seng Hospital, wanting to make sure that the uh, the, the workers, um, the allied health workers and the, the medical community were always you know, keeping tabs about what's happening in the hospital in terms of outbreaks because they're always exposed to patients. So 
So we, we came up with this, um, a very um, simple community-owned system where, uh, like Craig's uh, system, you just have to report, you know, uh, or any, any type of symptoms you may have. And that was structured by departments, different floors, different parts of the building, and so on. And so every day, the people in the hospital will be kept appraised of how many people may be having these symptoms in, around them. And you know, and we pilot tested it, so it's it's quite easy to pilot test before you think about a much larger national level or regional level effort, and you know, to be able to see what are uh, to to use um, scientific um, knowledge to determine um, what sort of benefits you are able to gather, and then use that as a launching platform to to go larger into um, into a national level effort. But just working with you know one unit, uh, doing something that's uh, that's that with the the community um, being involved, getting ideas back, doing focus groups, you know, going back and forth in that space, and then very clearly showing what the benefits of um, having that knowledge for that community would be uh, would be a good start. Great. Any final words of wisdom here? <laughs> yeah, I. I I, I would uh, reiterate just uh, what Dr. May said. Maybe we start with with a small uh, group at the at the community first, together with uh, your team, uh, and decide what what uh, how how the community knowledge and uh, decides or, or want need can be uh, fit in your system. In, in your drafting system. And my final words for, to make uh, the community own surveillance system, one health system, I think we have learned uh, from our experience that uh, the, the technology, the app can really help, but you have to train them how to use the dashboard. And there, there are other tools uh, manage, manage, managing uh, requirement that uh, the community has uh, to be able to do. The second thing is to decide the working process at the community level. Because when uh, the reporter report the abnormal event, that event may be a cluster of disease should be timely response, mm. not waiting for the central government and then uh, one year later share you back the information. But you have to, uh, the, the system should be immediately benefit the community. So and thirdly, how the uh, community can maintain the uh, reporter within the system. If you focus only animal disease outbreak, it's only two times outbreak a year. <laughs> the question is, this, this is uh, useful uh, tool or not? You use only two times in a year. That's the, the community will forget it, how to use this tool. I guess for us, a lot of the le learning and information that <laughs> comes out of this at the community level is actually in the process. You know, this kind of interview, it's a semi-structured interview where you use different tools and exercises, matrix scoring, mapping, uh, diagramming, and it's like a mini workshop. It's not like a questionnaire survey. And at the end of it, the participants will often say, now I understand better our own situation because they've disaggregated their information and, and reconstructed it. They've made a complex diagram on the on the floor for you, even in the dirt sometimes, um, and and they come to new insights about their own livelihoods and what they need to do. That's one aspect. Response to their disease needs is another, but actually the the tools that we use were evolved to actually. Um, design project interventions. That's, what, that's where PRA came from. Part participatory learning and action is the new term. Um, so it should result in action that actually responds to them. And it should be something that 
that works for them, you know, not <laughs> culling of their animals without compensation, no, but actually formulating a response that, that, that you know, adds value for them, yeah, okay. Great, well, let's give a round of applause to our incredible panel. And we're gonna move now into a coffee break, so we'll have a chance for those of you whose questions we didn't get to, um, feel free to engage directly with our colleagues. And again, thank you so much.